So we continue today in Acts chapter 4, and um, just as a, a quick recap, remember what's happened is that Peter has, Peter and John have, uh, Peter and John were walking into the temple, and there was a man who was lame, laying there begging for alms, and he was 40 years old and lame from birth, and they, uh, Paul, or uh, Peter stretches out his hand, tells the guy to get up, and he does, and all the people are amazed, and it says all the people in the temple, they were gathering for prayers, all the people came out to the Solomon's portico, and they were amazed at what they had seen, and uh, Peter launched right into his second sermon. And then uh, out of that, because everybody in the temple knows what's going on, they've all seen this man in theory, we can assume he's been laying outside the beautiful gate where people go in for prayers every, three times a day. They go in, and he's been laying there, and we'll make the assumption he's been laying there for years and years and years and years and years and years. And we talked about one of the reasons that he was probably there is because when they go for prayers, one of the easiest things for the Jews to do was then to give money to him because that was part of their ritual, right? And so he was in a good spot. And so Peter looked at him and says, hey, man, look, I, you know, I don't have anything, but, but I do have something. Stand up. And, boy, can you imagine the, the ruckus this has caused? And it is a ruckus because we see what's happened here in chapter 4. So let's read our text. It's uh, Acts chapter 4, 1 through 22. It says, as they were speaking to the people, because remember, right then, Peter launched into his second sermon. That was the big time, second sermon. And he, you know, he's, he's pointing them out. He's saying, look, you the guys that killed him, you put him on the cross. He was the Messiah as prophesied, and he, he quoted from Psalms, and he quoted from something, something else, I forget. And uh, so as they were speaking to the people, so all of a sudden, all the attention has gone away from the, because remember, they were going in for prayers. All the attention has gone away from the prayers. It's gone away from the high priest and the priests, and whatever was going on, the entire focus of the temple, which is the center of Jerusalem, it's the, it's the, the I mean, it is the focal point of the city, and now all of a sudden, everybody is looking at Peter and John. And so what's happened is, so you have to think about, um, it would be like, in, think of it this way, if we're in the sanctuary for the worship service, and then all of a sudden somebody stands up and says something in the back, and so Conrad's standing up, he's starting to preach, but everybody's turned around and looking at what Willie's saying in the back, because Willie's got all, everybody's focus is off the, and so look what happens. Here's where we go. It says, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard uh, and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, mark that word there, right? Proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And we'll come back to that and the Sadducees in a minute. And they laid hands on them. This is the temple guard. Now remember, the, the, the Sanhedrin, which we'll talk about, the, the temple guard, I mean, they had their own police. The, sad, the ruling council had their own police force. That was the temple guard. So the captain of the temple guard, same ones that arrested Jesus in the garden, uh, came up and they laid hands on them, this is Peter and John, and put them in jail until the next day for it was already in the evening. It was the third hour for three in the afternoon. But many of those who had heard the message believed and the number of men came to be about 5,000. Wow. Now, we know that, right? We know that at Pentecost, at that day, 3,000 were saved. That's what Scripture, that's what Acts tells us. Now, we're, we're, we don't know exactly the timing of this, but it's got to be just a few days later. Now we got 2,000 more to get to 5,000. And it's interesting because it says men. Men. Kind of like with the feeding of the 5,000, it says they fed 5,000 men. Well, we extrapolate that to, to, to see that, well, that's just men. That doesn't count women, doesn't count children. So if it's 5,000 of them, it could have been 10 or 15,000 people got saved. These people are getting saved in the temple in Jerusalem. Talk about upsetting the, 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 the status quo. It's big time here. So the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. With Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, who were high priestly, of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, and when it says the center, so the, the, uh, the, the gathering place where the Sanhedrin met was a horseshoe, okay? So everybody's sitting around the horseshoe, right? So now they've got Peter and John and the lame man all standing right in the center. So they're, they're looking at it. 
Um, and it says, um, when they were in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? And it's interesting because they know, they had already said it was in the name of Jesus. And it says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, he's setting it up. He says, so you want to put us on trial? And you guys on trial because you want to know how was this man made, made, made whole? How was he healed? Let me tell you. Verse 10. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, Jesus Christ, this man, the lame man, stands here before you in good health. Only by this name. He, Jesus Christ, verse 11, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. Right? Only, only through Jesus. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, and we'll talk about what that means in a few minutes, uneducated and untrained, right? They were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. They go, okay, wait a minute. You guys were with Jesus. And seeing the man that they had healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. Or as he's got them, Peter and John got a boxed in, well, God's got a boxed in a corner. Because all the people saw this guy get healed. They all knew who he was. He'd been outside the temple. And again, we have to make, we know it's 40 years. He's 40 years old. So again, has he been outside the temple for five, the last five years, last 10, 15, 20, 30? Uh, don't know. But he'd been there a long time. Everybody knew who he was. And seeing the man had been healed, they had nothing to, to, to reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another. So the Sanhedrin, they ordered them to leave, say, y'all come, come out. And so everybody leaves so these guys can talk amongst themselves. Right? And um, they want to talk with one and confer with one another. They say, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that they are a noteworth, that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. So now we've got to work on it. So now what they do is they call their public relations department so they can work on the spin. They've got to spin the story somehow. How are they going to do this? So, so, but so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they summon them, so now they call them back in. So they say, look, we can't do it. Everybody saw it, right? We can't deny the miracle. But what we'll do is we'll just bring them in and we'll tell them they can't talk about this name of Jesus anymore. We'll just tell them what to do. <clears throat> when they summoned them in, um, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said, whether, this is Martin Luther right here, almost paraphrasing, mm -hmm. right? Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. Yeah. You be the judge. Hmm. Interesting. But Peter and John answered them and said, Whether it be right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather to God, then, then you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Can't do it. Hmm. When they threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis to punish them on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. So again, why did they let them go? Because all the people were there glorifying God. And they knew they'd have a rebellion on their hands if they tried to go against, because everybody had seen it. This was not a, this was not something you could push in a, For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. So now we got the Sanhedrin, we got the Jewish leaders in a conundrum. They don't know what to do. Peter and John have come in, they've healed in the name of Jesus right there within that. And so what happens is. All of a sudden, and I believe we're probably within a week or so of Pentecost here. So the church starts at Pentecost. Within a week, the persecution begins. One week. We got persecution going on all over the place. And, and isn't it interesting? Where's the persecution coming from? Is it coming from a lost pagan world? No. It's coming from the inside. It's coming from the religious leaders of the day. The church came up against this Jewish establishment, a system right, that had been established by God, but it was so corrupt 
in legalism and traditionalism that it wasn't even recognizable. I mean, these were this, this, these were these people, the Sanhedrin, which is the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Uh, they were corrupt. They were as corrupt as any group you could imagine. Um, they weren't practical. We tend to think, or at least I tend to think, oh yeah, they were up there doing all the stuff that God had told them to do, following the law. They weren't. They made up all these extra rules, all these things, and the persecution was coming against them. Matthew 15, 9, we'll get to these other two, Psalm and, and Ephesians, we'll get to those later on. Uh, in Matthew 15, 9 says this, but in vain do they worship me, teaching as their doctrines the precepts of men. So in other words, they've, they've gotten completely away from God's word, and they were teaching all these precepts of men. The, the, over the years, over the 400 and some years between the end of Malachi and when Jesus came, is all they, they come up with all these extra rules and these traditions. You've got to do things this way, that way. Precepts of man, right? Similar to today, right? The precepts of man are what being taught in a lot of churches. God's just love. It's okay if you are homosexual or if you're transgender or if you're this, if you're that. It doesn't matter because God's word is an old-fashioned book. We've changed. We've gotten smarter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not really. Persecution, by the way, is a hidden blessing for the church. We're going to see five times in 11 years the enemy stretches out and persecutes the church. But the great thing is, even though persecution is a terrible thing, it's always good for the church because it causes the church to grow. It grows in purity, and it grows in numbers during persecution. And God actually used the persecution in Jerusalem to scatter the church so that it would continue to grow. Um, as Christians, we should never be surprised that when we preach the gospel, when we share the gospel with people, that it upsets them. See, we think it's good news because it is good news. But uh, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live in godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Will be persecuted. So when persecution comes, we shouldn't be upset about it because <laughs> it's going to come, right? Uh, Christians, if Christians are to be faithful in proclaiming the gospel, we can expect, right, to be offensive to a great deal of society. They're going to scream you down. They're going to scream down Christianity. Just like they're screaming down this supposed verdict that's coming out in the Roe v. Wade. What are they doing? They scream people down. That's what they do. When Christians are faithful, they experience some persecution. There was a uh, theologian, James Stewart, said, It is a terrible thing when the church is content to cultivate inoffensiveness. When you're content to cultivate inoffensiveness. We see it all around us today. In other words... We don't want to talk about sin because that might hurt somebody's feelings. The very first persecution came from religious people. Why? Because they were threatening the religious establishment. Um, the political and, and religious body of Jerusalem was a Sanhedrin. So the Sanhedrin is made up of 71 people, 71 men, 70 men plus the high priest. <coughs> and the power structure of the Sanhedrin was in the Sadducees. So you have Sadducees and Pharisees. The Sadducees, Pharisees are more the religious leaders. Sadducees were a, um, what we would call blue bloods. They were blue blood Jewish. Um, they were the controlling group. They were wealthy. They were intellectual. They were aristocrats. Um, they were the ones who cut the deals with the Romans. Hey, look, we'll control the people through what? We'll control the people through our religion. And in, in exchange... You'll give us a lot of latitude to do what we want. That's what they did. That's why they were the ones, the high priests, Caiaphas and Annas, they were Sadducees. And now remember, Sadducees don't believe, interesting, they don't believe in the supernatural. They don't believe in bodily resurrection. Now remember, Caiaphas, the high priest, and Annas, they, they, they are Sadducees. They do not believe in the resurrection. And they don't believe in angels. They don't believe in demons. And it's interesting. So between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you had this huge conflict because the Sadducees only really believed in the, in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. But in the Old Testament, you have what's called the oracles of God. And the oracles of God are the Pentateuch, right? 
which is the five, first five books, plus the prophets and the hymns, which would be uh, that's which would be Psalms, Proverbs, all that. But the Sadducees only believed in the first five books, those history books. And so now, traditionalism, as I told you, the Pharisees during this intertestament period had gobbled on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of extra rules and laws. Traditionalism. So that's what they believed in. Sadducees didn't believe in that stuff. So then you so now what you have to look at is you have to think about it. the Sadducees, no resurrection. They don't believe in any afterlife which is crazy. And so you think, you sit there and you think, well, if they don't believe in an afterlife, they don't believe in angels, they don't believe in demons, then were they really Jews? By birth. They didn't believe in anything. They didn't believe the Old Testament prophets, what they said. They didn't believe in the Psalms. Now, so let's back our story up and figure out what's going on here. Okay? So you've got this ruling group that doesn't believe in the resurrection. And so they're saying there is no resurrection. Well, then if somebody's resurrected, that means what, what's the challenge to the Sadducees? They're wrong. Now, what had happened about two months prior to this day? What's that? No. Lazarus. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. That was the week before Palm Sunday that he did that. Now, if we go to... Um, if we go to John 5th, uh, wait a minute, hang on, I got wrong. Well, well, we'll get to John, we'll get, we'll get to John. So if you remember in John, and we'll read it in a few minutes, in John, when Jesus, that was the last miracle that he did, the biggest miracle of the book of John, and he raised Lazarus from the dead, and we see, if you read there, that the, the, the Jews were there, and that's when they said, we got to squash this because he resurrected somebody from the dead. And now what you have is, now you've got Peter and John saying that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. So you're going, they're going against the tradition. And, and I believe from history that, that I've read, the Sadducees, were in, they were in bed, the Sanhedrin, they were in bed with the Romans. Because you remember the tax collectors, what did the tax collectors do? Tax collectors could, tax, could, could set their tax rates anywhere they wanted. Right? But they had to give a they had to give a huge cut to Rome. But they and they, they kept what was on they kept so in other words, if I come and I'm a tax collector and I come to Kevin and Laurie and I say, Your tax is twenty dollars. Well realistically, the tax that I've got to give to the Romans is ten. But I got graft, so I'm gonna take my ten off the top. Well guess who appoints the tax collectors? Sanhedrin. It's a power play. So guess what? So when I'm a tax collector, I'm gonna coll collect my twenty bucks from Kevin and Laurie. I got to give ten to the Romans. I got to give five to the Sanhedrin, because otherwise Sanhedrin have power. They're not going to let you, as a Jew, they're going to let Matthew, who is a tax collector. Matthew got appointed. You don't stand up and go. I won't be a tax collector from now on. No, 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 no. The establishment decides who gets to be the tax collectors. So they're getting a cut on this. So this whole thing of Jesus' resurrection and these guys coming in and saying the name of Jesus and all this, it's completely messing up their financial world. You start messing with people's finances. You start messing with, you, you, you want to get somebody squashed down, right? And, and, and Acts 23.8 says, For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So you got this power play in the Sanhedrin, but the Sadducees are in charge. We think the Pharisees are the big guys. They're really not. The Sadducees are the ones that are. So this is power play between them. The Sadducees are equivalent to the modern day, what I'll call modern day liberals in Christianity. They hold to the ethical teachings of Christ but deny the inspiration of Scripture and the supernatural. It's what you get in many mainstream denominational churches in this country today. Right? It's all about love, 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 grace, grace, grace. We don't ever talk about sin. We don't ever talk about salvation. In other words, they deny, you know, Scripture's old. It's not really, you know, it's an old-fashioned book. We've changed. We've evolved. No, we haven't. 
Not at all. So that's liberalism today. Liberals encourage Christ to be spoken of as a teacher, an example, a leader, but we don't want to talk about that he's resurrected, he's Savior, and if you don't bow your knee to him, you will reside permanently in hell. We're going to talk about sinners. The greatest antagonism to Christ comes from liberal theologians who will not bow down and call him Lord in Christ, who exalt their minds above the mind of God. We're smarter than the Bible. The Bible's old-fashioned. The Sadducees had the power to declare, here's the key, who could and could not be teachers in Jerusalem. They decided, just like they decided who could and couldn't be a tax collector. So now these guys are coming in. And what does it say? Remember we read this verse in verse 13? Now they observed, this is the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the confidence of Peter and John and understand that they were uneducated and untrained. We can't let these hillbillies come in here and take things over, right? The only people that are allowed to talk about religion are the religious leaders. See, Jesus cut that all off, right? Because we don't need a priest anymore to go and approach the throne of God, do we? We can go boldly ourselves into the throne room of God. The whole thing change. The apostles, it's interesting, as I read this, I think about all the things that Jesus said must have been, and I believe, I firmly believe, the Holy Spirit's just bringing this stuff right up to Peter and John. Oh, you remember when he said that? And here's one, John 15, 20. Remember the word I said to you, this is Jesus, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. John 16, 1 and 2, what did Peter, and when you look at when John 16 was, timeline, it wasn't that long ago, from when he says, these things I have spoken to you, is Jesus talking to his disciples, that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is observing service, to, or he is offering service to God. That's the Apostle Paul. Think about it. Paul was persecuting the church. Don't, think Paul, and listen to this line again. They will make you outcast from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is observing or he is offering service to God. Wasn't that what Paul was doing? Yeah. Paul was saying, I'm going to stamp this foolishness out. We're Jews. We're on tradition. We're, this is what we are. We're not going to let this Christianity come in and bust up our power. Not going to do it. And, but did Paul think he was sincerely doing what God wanted him to do with the first few Christians? <laughs> Absolutely he did. He believed that 100%. He was a Jew. Mark 13, 9. Here's another one. Jesus said, Be on your guard, for they will deliver you up to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. Don't you think that? Peter and John, as they're standing before the Sanhedrin, and they're telling them, Stop doing this stuff. Stop doing this stuff. He said, Look, they'll be flogged in the synagogues. You'll be delivered to the courts. They were arrested, put in jail overnight so they could get the Sanhedrin together the next day to come in and do that. So you see, this is the first collision of the church with the establishment, with the current, with, with the religion the way it was. And we tend to think, I tend to think, that the Jews were doing everything they were supposed to do. They were such a corrupt group. Um, so it's the first of ten persecutions directed to the, to the church in the first three centuries. And this is the first one. So... Going to jail for doing good, isn't it interesting? Um, <clears throat> the temple guard and the Sadducees, they had a vested interest, right? Because they say there is no resurrection. And these guys are running around saying, not only is there a resurrection, we showed you the resurrection with, with, with Lazarus two months ago, and now we're telling you Jesus was resurrected. Now remember, there's a... Well, no, we'll get on the rat back. Um, it's arrested and put in jail overnight. So let's look at John 11. I didn't write this up there. John 11 back to Lazarus, but I think it's important that we look at it. Um, John 11, 45 through 57. John 11, 45. Therefore, this is, so G Jesus said just 44, the dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips, his face wrapped in cloth. Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. It's Lazarus coming out. 
Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did, what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees, chief priests or Sadducees, and the Pharisees convened the Sanhedrin and were saying, what are we going to do since this man is doing so many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place, means power, and our nation. In other words, their whole thing, with the Romans would take over an area, they would get, it's like the Vichy French, right? When they took over, when the Germans took over France in World War II, they set up the Vichy government, which was the French, they were collaborators with the Germans. Remember what happened when the, when the, when, when the United States and the Brits liberated them? What did they do to all those government officials? They took them out and killed them all, because they were what? They were in bed with the Nazis. That's what this is. These guys are in bed with the Romans. Look what it says. What should we do? If we let him go on like this, people will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Our power is what it said. One of them, Caiaphas, same guy who's here in Acts chapter 4, <clears throat> who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You're not considering that it is your advantage that one man should die for the people rather than the nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to unite the scattered children of God. So from that day on, they plotted to kill him. See? Because not only was he performing all these things, but Caiaphas says, look, man, we better off killing one dude to have our nation killed. Right? In other words, we don't want to lose the graft that we are getting and the power that we have. So, what happened? They arrested him. They put him in jail. <clears throat> and we got all these people that have come. And then they interrogate him, right? They order him before the Sanhedrin. 71 old men standing up there looking down on him. How dare you say these things, right? And it says, and isn't it interesting? Look how they ask, look at the questions they ask. By what power and what name have you done this? By what power and name have you healed this guy? In other words, they're trying to equate it back to them. Even though Peter had already preached, right? And who, in chapter 3, who did the healing? It wasn't them, it was God. Uh, the power and name. And Peter, Peter answers them in the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at this. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Now remember, just like us, Peter was indwelt with the Spirit, just like we're indwelt with the Spirit. But are we walking filled in the Spirit each day? Peter filled with the Spirit. Got a fresh filling right there. And you go, we'll go back and we'll read that. A fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. It, isn't it interesting? And again, I go back and I look and I say, what is he remembering when he's standing there? In other words, they, they put him in jail overnight. All right? <clears throat> Next day, so they're in jail. He and John are locked up. What are they doing when they're locked up? They're praying. Yeah, and they're remembering. And so I think they're bantering back and forth to each other. John says to Peter, hey, do you remember what Jesus said? Peter says, to, hey, do you remember what... <clears throat> Here's one, Luke 12, 11 through 13. And I think, I, I, I just believe this is one of the scriptures that they reminded each other of when they were in jail overnight, getting ready to go before the court. <clears throat> Luke 12, 11 through 13 says, Now when they bring you to the synagogue and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. In the future. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. So do you see that? So I think that's just... What, you know what? Peter and John go, are you worried? No, I'm not worried. You worried? No, I'm not worried. Why aren't you worried? Because I got the Holy Spirit. And the Master said that the Holy Spirit will teach us what to say. So they're just praying, Lord, we know we're going to stand there no more. I'm filled with the Spirit. Give me the words you want me to say when I'm there. Boom! It's that easy. And we're going to tie that into an application for us. So, notice he was very respectful. And what power and what name? Didn't sugarcoat it. Look what he said. Let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ and Nazarene, and let me remind you, who you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, Jesus Christ, the lame man stands before you in grand health. That wasn't Peter's words. Those weren't Peter's words. Those were the Holy Spirit's words. Peter was just the mouth that did it. And I want you to see that. It's very important that we see that because... In Luke, Luke 12, it says, 
for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. What hour? When you stand before the synagogues and the magistrates and authorities. Or the Antichrist. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the future. Well, but it's but it's also what we're gonna what we're gonna learn is that it's it <coughs> Peter accused the Sanhedrin of rejecting and killing the Messiah, right? And he also proclaimed God's power in raising him from the dead. So there was a verbal and there was a visible. The verbal was the name of Jesus and the power of God, right? That's the verbal. I'm telling you, it's the name of Jesus and it's the power of God. And the visual is what? The lame man standing before you. In other words, right here, here it is. I don't have to, go, I don't have to convince you. I don't have to give you my great high theology. All I'm going to do is tell you, Jesus Christ the Nazarene in the power of God, boom. This guy you've been watching for 40 years lay on the ground and beg, he's standing up. In fact, he wasn't just standing. Remember what we read in chapter 3? What was he doing? He was jumping up and down and dancing and praising. Can you imagine he's using his feet for the first time trying to figure out? Like, I do this. I go over here. I come over here if I want to go this way. Right? He's never done that before. He's watched people do it. He's dancing. Right? He's going at it. And he's excited. He wasn't standing there like this. He was standing there like, yeah, me, power, Jesus, right here. My feet, I'm walking. Can't you see me? And so this whole thing. And so Peter and John, they don't have to come up with anything great. All they got to do is go, yeah, right here. There you go. You know, top that, people. Top that. Can you do that? I don't think so. Right? So, um, salvation is needed by all. And that's where you go. Oh, sorry. Let's go back. Uh, in verse 11. Look at verse 11. This is really important. He says, He, Jesus Christ the Nazarene, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builder, but which became the chief cornerstone. So, now, so what is this? What's, and again, you got to remember, these are uneducated fishermen. And they're quoting Scripture. Psalm, so what is that? It's Psalm 118.22, and I don't want us to miss this. These two quotes that he makes. Psalm 118.22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The cornerstone of faith, the cornerstone of God is what? Is, is, is Jesus Christ. He's the cornerstone. That's the, the most important stone in the temple. Right? And then you go over to Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. What's it say? It says, So then you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together for God's dwelling spirit. So you see that? He's going and he's quoting. He says, you rejected, you rejected the cornerstone. That's what we're going to, what he's really saying is, you're out, we're in. We're going to build God's temple on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. You're done. You're over. It's in. It's ending for you. Uh, men must be saved. And that's the idea. So let's look at a couple of, a couple of concepts about this whole, which I believe is where he's going with this. There is a great necessity for people to be saved. Why, was, why must we be saved? Three parables. And I believe this applies here. One is the lost sheep. Two is the coin. Three is the prodigal son. Alright? So, what is the great necessity to be saved? Why? Because we are lost. That's the sheep. Right? That's what that parable means. We're lost, which means we need salvation. We're helpless, the parable of the coin. And we're hopeless, the prodigal son. He was hopeless, right? He was in the pig pen, eating pig pen food. Then he, I'm hopeless. It was at the end of the room, right? There's a great possibility. We must be saved. The great possibility is salvation. What are the characteristics of salvation? Number one, back to the same thing, a pardon for the past. That's the prodigal son, right? Power for the present. That's the coin. Peace for the future. That's the sheep. And there's a great provision. What, what, where does salvation come from? The name of Jesus Christ. It's Christ's death for pardon. Christ's life for power. His presence for peace. And the opportunity, it's available to everyone. 
It's absolutely. Because remember we read last week, Peter's sermon, and you know he's looking at these Jews, and he's going, you're the ones who crucified him. And you would think he would say, so out of here forever. He says, but if you'll repent and believe, then salvation is even for the ones who put physically, not physically, but literally put Jesus on the cross. Those same people, right? So, um, we have to realize, right, that all a sinner's good works, prayers, powers, tears, beliefs, ordinances, resolves, religious professions will not get them into heaven, right? Jesus Christ is the only door and the only way to God's acceptance and forgiveness and blessing. There is none other. So, as I think about this, and I think about what Peter is doing, is every time, look at, we've seen, this is kind of his third sermon, if you will, standing before the courts. He had his first sermon today at Pentecost. Second sermon was last week, right, when he healed the man. And now he's, it's kind of, a, it's not really kind of a sermon because he's proclaiming God's word, right? He's proclaiming Jesus. And so what I want to do is pause for a second and look at this idea of sharing your faith. Because that's all Peter was doing, honestly. He was sharing his faith. Why are you here? Why did you do it? I didn't do it. Jesus did it. Right? In the name of Jesus the Nazarene. So, sharing the faith is just about doing what? It's communicating facts about God. We talked about this last week. Facts about God, about sin and salvation. Right? So, the gospel is, it's sharing the faith. It's about God. It's about sin. And it's about salvation, right? You can't, I mean, you got right, because you can't, if you don't understand about sin, you don't see a need for salvation. If you don't understand who God is, you can't understand why sin separates you. And that therefore, you need salvation to be reconciled to God. So it's just it's simple, three simple things. It's not high theology, which is why these uneducated, untrained men could do it. And what I want you to see is that what they, again, what I believe they were doing is they were in prayer in the jail that night. Going, you know what, Lord's going to fill us, going to give us the words. He told us, when you stand before the magistrates, when you stand before the authorities, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. Now, I want to take that concept, okay? Don't miss the concept, right? They're praying, and what do you do? He stood up, boom, had the words. You didn't hear him go. Uh, when they placed him in the center, they began to inquire by what name. And then Peter stumbled and tumbled and said, uh, well, uh, you know, I, I um, well, you know, um, uh, no. What did he say? Filled with the Holy Spirit, he said, rulers and elders of the people. So, now what I want to do is I want to take that concept, and I want to equate that concept to an application for us today. Okay? This is a year of missions in our church. Right? So that's a year of supporting missionaries, whether they're overseas or they're here local. But the reality is what we're trying to also make, make sure that everybody understands is we are missionaries. That's when we are saved, God calls us into the mission field. To share our faith. So, what we want to do is, well, and because most people, most people are, are uncomfortable sharing their faith or are nervous about sharing their faith. And what I want to do is tell you if you're ever nervous about it or if you're ever uncomfortable about it, go back and read the story. And go back and read Luke 11 or Luke 12, 11 through 13, where it says the Holy Spirit will give you the words. If you seek the opportunities, then the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say, to talk to people about Jesus. And again, remember, it's not about whether you're saving them because you're not saving anybody. God saves them. Our job is to be the mouthpiece, just like Peter and John. They were just there to be the mouthpiece, right? They did something. Holy Spirit prompted them to lift the guy up. He stands up. He goes in. Holy Spirit's filling him up. He's telling them what the Spirit is saying. So what I thought about is, each sharing our faith is just about sharing our own story, right? This is all. Sharing faith is sharing our story. And everybody's story is different. Everybody's story is different. But you've got to share it. And so what I did was I looked at, and I mean, these aren't original for me. I've come up with different ones. Uh, six different approaches to evangelism. Practical approaches and based on different personalities, right? Mm -hmm. None of them are wrong. They're all a good way to do it, but here's six, let me give you six different ways to share your faith. First one, and, and we'll give you biblical examples of each one, by the way. It's not just Raymond's opinion. Um, first one is what we see in the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, and that was a confrontational style. He was really good with the confrontation. Direct, 
in conversation. So the person who's like Peter in the confrontational style is very direct. Not him hauling around, not beating around the woods. Bold and confident, right? Just here's what it is. You're a sinner. God declared you're a sinner, which means you're separated from God and you're going to spend eternity in hell unless you repent and believe that Jesus Christ died for you. I mean, just right up front, telling people, boom, 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 boom. That's it. Nothing wrong with that. If that's what fits your personality or if that's what fits the situation, allow the Spirit to prompt. Second way would be the intellectual style. And the example of that would be Paul in Acts chapter 17 in Athens on Mars Hill, right? He was amongst all the philosophers and all the intellectual types. And what did he do? Paul used logical analysis and discussion to talk about who God was, right? That's what he did in that particular place. So that's a person who enjoys discussions and debate and trying to understand logic. Well, logically, how could this be? If that's your personality, that's one that would fit great for you in that. The third way would be a testimonial style, telling your story. That's the blind man in John chapter 9. Go back and read John 9 and read the story of the blind man. It's fascinating because they keep trying. They, they take him before the council, right? And say, well, how, how do you see anymore, right? Say, yeah, who did this? Look, hey, man, I don't know. How did, you get blind? how did you get to see? Look, I don't know, man. I was standing on the side of the road. Dude walks up to me, reaches down, but something on my face, right? And next thing I know, he says, go to the pool and rinse your eyes out and I can see. Right? That's a testimonial style. Look, man, this is who I was. This is what happened. God, one day, bam, it was it. I was at the bottom, right? Maybe a testimonial style would be you, you, tell, you like to tell stories about what is, or maybe you have a great story. I was the prodigal son. I was at the end of my rope. I was doing drugs. I was drinking, whatever it was, and God rescued me out of that. Right? That's a testimony. That's what the blind man did. It's a great testimony. Read his testimony. Because he keeps saying again and again. Remember, they brought his parents in. Parents said, oh, is that him? Yeah, it looked like him. The same kid we recognized. Well, how did I don't know how it happened. Ask him. Testimony. Third is a interpersonal style. That's in Luke 5 where Matthew, what does Matthew do? Matthew invites Jesus. Matthew's a tax collector. So what does he do? He invites Jesus to come to the tax collector cookout. Remember? And the Sanhedrin, right, they're going, oh, why, why, would, why would you want to cavort with, with those guys? Of course, they were cavorting with the tax collectors behind the scene with their hands out, right? But they wouldn't publicly go and hang out with them. But that was what Matthew was. Matthew's like, man, let me, come on, let, let me tell you about, let me bring Jesus in here. Those are relational people. You build relationships and you share the source of your joy and your, and, and your life and your love. Within that story, so in other words, and I have a friend who is a, a, just an awesome soul winner. And his way of doing it is this interpersonal style. He's amazing. He's, I mean, he has led more people to Christ. And what he does is he just prays till God targets somebody. It's usually somebody he's known for years. And he goes up, <clears throat> and it'd be Dave. I say, Dave, man, you want to get a cup of coffee next week? Tuesday morning, man, let's get a cup of coffee. So, Dave, we need coffee. It's been an hour or so. And then at the end of that conversation, I say, man, why don't we get together again next Tuesday? This is good. I enjoyed this. I enjoyed it. You know, you and I have known each other for years, but don't really know each other that well, right? And man, all of a sudden, boy, he'll do that. And he'll meet with guys for a month, two months, three months, six months. He doesn't matter. And, boy, they, and it'll all, that conversation will come around to Jesus. And then those people will end up, and he'll put the question to them. I've seen him do it with dozens and dozens of men. Mm -hmm. That's his style, interpersonal. He builds that relationship, and then he starts talking to him about, I mean, have you ever really thought much about faith? Have you thought much about God, and, you, you know, Jesus, and, the, you know, eternity? Just, man, the story just coming. And again, usually these are men that he's known for years and years. A lot of them knew him pre-salvation. Most of them probably knew him pre-salvation. Another one is an invitational style. That's the Samaritan woman, right? What happened? Remember the Samaritan woman? When Jesus, she runs back to the city and tells everybody, come see this man. That's an invitation. you gotta, you got to come hear Conrad preach, man. you got to come to sit through one of our... Come on Wednesday nights and, and be with us. And come on Wednesday night. That's an invitation. Come and see what this is all about. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. But find a way, right, sometimes, because remember when uh, 
Philip would bring, Philip had this knack of bringing people to Andrew or to Jesus to answer their questions. Remember the well, we've got some questions. He goes, here, let me, let me bring you over here to this guy. He can answer your questions. Answer this guy's questions, right? That's an imitational style. Nothing wrong with that. All of these, there's nothing wrong with any of these. We'll run behind here. Um, and then the last one would be a serving style. And that's in Acts chapter 9, we see with Tabitha and Dorcas. She was full of good works and charitable deeds. She helped people everywhere, making them clothes. She had an impact on her city, right? So that type of person would see the needs of people, um, would find a way to fill it, would show love through action rather than words, but they're always looking for a way to uh, ensure them that they, why are you doing this for me? Because of the love of God. So you see, through service, we serve others. They go, why are you serving me? Why are you doing this for me? So share your faith your way. That's the key, to share your faith your way. Um, you know, we've got enough. We probably have to this. Um, Their bluff had gotten called and they got released. Verse 19 is really key because here's what it says, and this is a verse that we should know because we have, to, we have to make decisions this way in the same way. It says, but Peter and John answered them and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather to God, you be the judge. So he's challenged them. In other words, what he's saying is we must obey God, not men. And those are decisions that we're going to have to make. Those decisions our family, our children are going to have to make, right? When somebody says, you know, you can't wear that T-shirt to school or to work that says, that's got a cross on it or says God or something like that, right? Then we have to say, wait a minute, no, no, I have to obey God, not men, in these types of things. Now, I'm not saying that if your boss tells you not to wear something, I'm not telling you what to do, but you got to speak about that. It says, we can't speak. Look what he says. He says, we can't stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. So stop telling about that. Stop talking about Jesus. He says, I'm not stopping talking about Jesus because of what he did for me. Right? Isn't it interesting? I thought about John Bunyan. You know, John Bunyan, the real Pilgrim's Progress, was in jail for years because he was preaching the gospel. And But outside of the religious authority and rules at the time. And um, he said about getting released from prison today, same thing. He said, if you let me out of prison today, I will preach again tomorrow by the grace of God. He said, if I lie in jail till moss grows on my eyelids, I will never conceal the truth which God has taught me. He was teaching outside the establishment church, talking about Jesus. That's where he wrote Pilgrim's Progress when he was there. So, um, <clears throat> testimony. So here's, here's three, a threefold secret about the testimony. Right, testimony must be filled with the Spirit, right? Don't use your words, use the Spirit's words, right? The character must always be about Jesus. It's not about us. It's about what Jesus has done for us. And then for work, we have to do everything in the name of Jesus. Why do we do this? We do this in the name of Jesus, right? So thus grace can transform ordinary people, which is what Peter and John were, into strong, noble, courageous witnesses and workers for Jesus. And if you can take those two hibbolites and do it, you can take us and make us bold for Christ and bold for sharing our word. Amen? Amen. All right, we'll pick up uh, after that next week. So let's close in prayer.